Welcome everyone to the uh, 361st first meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. This is a weekly series of um, talks with cartoonists, people who make comics, people who write about comics, people who publish comics, people who think about comics, talks with people who work with comics in some way. It was founded about a decade ago by Ben Catcher. Um, my name is Austin English. I'm co-curating this season, uh, this calendar season with Ben. And um, we are very, very excited for tonight's guest, uh, Pris Janae, who is a cartoonist and um, the publisher of Oregon uh, Bank. And these are some of the publications that um, Chris publishes. And Chris, I think, is going to go into some of the stories around uh, the founding of this label, um, how it's run now, some of uh, Chris's philosophy um, around what it means. Um, and so rather get rather than getting into um, those parts of it myself, I just want to say my feeling about um, the publications that that come out from this label has uh, my admiration for for um, uh, what's done with this label has a lot to do with the idea of um, this is this is a a publisher that puts out things that in some way or other maybe maybe you would call them horror comics things that deal with with um, with horror in some kind of way. And when we had Vanessa Conte uh, come in and talk to the symposium, Vanessa Conte makes uh, comics with a lot of sexual content. And when she was giving her talk, it made me think about how, you know, comics as a medium, the history of comics, they're littered with comics that have um, sexual content in them, obviously, right? And uh, with Vanessa Conte's talk, it really, it really, um, alerted me to, or just, you know, reminded me of, of this uh, unavoidable truth that, this medium uh, traffics in comics with sex, horror, violence, whatever, but they so often um, don't really explore these things at all. They're they're um, whether they're commercial or 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 uh, not highly commercial. They're often um, um, they're often just trying to to uh, get at some genuine feeling within uh, the theme that they're exploring. And these comics from Organ Bank. Um, Calling them horror comics, I feel, is is a disservice to what actually happens with them. They're, the beauty of, of what happens in these publications um, goes so far beyond what that term might imply. And I think uh, brings a real um, experience and a real transgressive idea of uh, what you can do with this medium. I think a lot of a lot of people who work with horror comics aspire to something transgressive, but what's in these publications um, truly does that. So I'm very honored to um, have Pris talk to us about these works and their own work tonight. Um, the symposium is really uh, meant to be a unity between um, a speaker and audience. So I encourage you as, as the presentation is going to, if you have a question, to write the question in the chat. Um, you'll be, you can either read the question out loud yourself, or, um, you can note to me that you want me to read it, um, for you. Uh, but I really do encourage you to, um, treat this, you know, after, after Pris's presentation is over to treat this as a, a, a conversation with the presenter as, as, um, much as you would like to. So I'm going to read a quick bio here. First, I'm going to put a link in the chat, um, to Oregon Bank's website, uh, which might be useful as things go on. And um, I'm going to read a bio of Pris right now. Give me one moment. Um, Pris Janae is a cartoonist, writer, and the current editor of Organ Bank, co-founded by her late partner, Morgan Vogel. Uh, without further ado, here is Pris Janae. Hey. Um, so... I guess the big thing here is um, to give some context for the project for Oregon Bank and for my partner, Morgan. Um, it's a kind of strange project to quantify. Um, I guess I want to start by talking about Morgan a little bit. Today is like around a week after her birthday would have been on the 20th. Um, and about three years ago, in somewhat of a fit of psychosis, she hiked a number of miles and jumped off the French King Bridge. Um, the project went on hiatus for about two years. Um, and now I've been attempting to kind of rebuild it and attempting to see 
how I can honor her like really unique and controlled and atavistic vision um, and expand the project while like keeping that true and staying true to her, right? Um, so I'm gonna share my, my screen and I'm gonna get started on this talk, which is kind of an attempt to uh, talk a little bit about the history of organ bank and to really get into the kind of philosophy of what we're dealing with. Um, all right, share screen. So my title for this is called uh, Bacchic procession at the crossroads of limit experience, everyday life, subculture, and wandering. Um, this is a picture of Morgan outside of the cave of Kelpius, which is a really interesting spot in Philadelphia. Um, supposedly the meditation cave, at least claimed by the Rosicrucian Society to be uh, the meditation cave of the millennial, millenarian rather. <laughs> um, mystic Kelpius, uh, whose compound was relatively nearby. The Freemasons claimed that it was actually a salt cave, but that's kind of beside the point. Um, so my first encounter with Morgan was at Cake um, around Chicago Alternative Comics Expo around 2018. I first came into contact with her work through her comics, specifically through work published by um, 2D Cloud. My friend John recommended them to me, um, and I was immediately drawn to kind of her as a person. They were all published under the name Tracy Ock, which was what I knew her as. And um, the back cover of Necrophilic Landscape uses this just really incredible quote from Mary Daly's Gynecology that says males do indeed deeply identify with quote, unwanted fetal tissue, unquote, for they sense as their own condition, the role of controller, possessor, inhibitor of women, draining female energy, they feel fetal. Since this perpetual fetal state is fatal to the self of the eternal mother hostess, males fear women's recognition of the real condition, which would render them infinitely unwanted. For this attraction slash need of males for female energy, for what it is, is necrophilia, not in the sense of love for actual corpses, but of love for those victimized into a state of living death. Um, and this quote deals with a lot of stuff that I'm going to talk about throughout this uh, abjection, um, victimization, and, and undeath, right? Um, and vampirism and necrophilia, right? But um, it was so striking to me because it has this sort of like satirical aspect that um, is prevalent through all of Morgan's work as, as I've you know, seen work that she made since then and, and work previously. Um, but calling it satirical almost feels like a disservice to what it's really doing, which is, is a real transgression, is a presentation of taking like the sort of source material and really chopping and screwing it into this, um, into this pure vision, right? Um, so the other thing I saw of Morgan's was uh, a piece she had in the first anthology, uh, Mirror Mirror anthology that 2D Cloud was putting out. Um, and this piece was called Mirror Prosthesis and was a sort of theory fiction poetry analysis of uh, tampon advertisements. Um, and this was like both drawing on a lot of things I was interested in. Uh, Nick Land, Reza Negar Astani, um, people who took kind of the form of critical theory and made it didactic and aggressive and creative. Um, she's quoting Henry Bergson here. She's quoting Elizabeth Gross, who I was reading at the time. Um, and it's just phenomenal, right? Um, there's a, a conversation of amputation and toxic 
toxic shock syndrome um and they this idea of like the configuration of this prosthetic element of the body um and you know i was really excited to see her talk about uh gross in particular because i was focused on her idea of constructing somewhat of a negative identity for women that is formed you know she's a, a lacanian feminist and she talks about this idea of women perceiving themselves in almost like a perpetual mirror stage um, through the exterior eye of like as, as an object through the eye of other subjects, right? Um, and so this is something that specifically it really uh, reminded me of and that a lot of concepts in her work, in our publication work in Organ Bank and my own work is really inspired by this is a quote from Nick Land, um, the vast abrupt speed cut within abysm where Gibson splices Milton into a labyrinth of limbo circuitry, cyber gothic flickers into neuroelectric scrawls, events so twisted they turn into cybernetics, a technolino mole of fast forward into microprocess damnation. And then he continues with this really great quote from, um, I think the difference engine or something like that, skyscrapers overshadowing 17th century graveyards, which is really the kind of idea that we're trying to delve into, which is this really accelerated and kind of horrifying future present, right? Um, and a larger sense of kind of a Gothic past. Um, so, this previous piece, Mary Prosthesis, I took pictures of um, like very shaky cell phone camera photos of and uploaded to Tumblr, which an account that appeared to be her reblogged at some point. Um, and it was exciting to me. And then, um, so, I, I wanted to go on to talk about um, a conversation I had at, at that first day where I met Morgan, um, where she told me that she had dressed as, as Pris from Blade Runner and Drew Andrew Drew for Electric Sheep uh, for Halloween. And this is a, a photo from that. Um, this ties to a lot of our kind of overlapping interest into this idea of kind of a vampiric or undead cyber gothic world. Um, and she had this up on Instagram with this quote from Ridley Scott. She would be one of the replicants who would die. There would be a replicant wake. It was like the wake of the vampires. So I, I talked to her about Pris quite a bit and my feelings about her as a, um, an, an expression of a sort of autism and the idea of androids as a, this sort of almost human or mimicry of humanity um, and the position of autistic people as being somewhat you know, on the the verge of humanity or perceived as someone inhuman, kind of drawing on some of my own experiences with uh, autism diagnosis as a child. Um, so these are some more screen caps from Necrophilic Landscape, uh, images of Necrophilic Landscape. I suppose it's not a film, but um, in them we see this just like intense kind of overdrawn claustrophobia, gore, aspects of like, a really striking humor. And, and the thing I wanna talk about quite a bit, which is the idea of the, um, the transition of social roles, the transgression of social roles, not necessarily, I mean, an abolition of roles themselves, but also in that the potential to be able to utilize and bludgeon and play with social roles. Because, um, you know, necrophilic landscape kind of resound, like builds on this, this beautiful realized very like um, the Gollum Prague style uh, Gothic world in which uh, children are surgically altered to or standing on top of each other in, in coats, right? And that there is a cabal that's secretly running huge sections of the world that are sort of like a masonry of, of children disguised as human, as uh, adults. And um, 
me see. I had something in, in here I specifically wanted to say about this. Um, so there's a lot I could say about the content of necrophilic landscape, but to my mind, at risk of sounding hyperbolic, it's one of the best long form comics. It's just this kind of overwhelmingly claustrophobic trip into an alien world that feels eerily as though a repressed memory, uh, shifted close dimensions, cramped, terrifying, filled with a resounding sardonic laughter. Um, and this piece is interesting. So in, in terms of humor, this is sort of the, um, the central joke of the whole piece is this panel, um, which is funny, right? But it's also just, just extremely kind of arresting. Um, but this stuff is curious because as we developed Organ Bank, her style really, really shifted and became quite a bit more refined. Um, not in the sense that this is bad at all, um, not in the sense of necessarily being better, but in terms of being just like extremely whittled down. She switched to using a Tachikawa school nib, which is just an incredibly stiff nib and uh, attempted to represent these just kind of perfectly defined images. Um, so she kind of started to shift into that style with her piece, um, Master of Drawing Circles, which at, at Chicago Alternative Comics Expo, where I met her, she left on my table, just like with an, I know anyone who knows her would know this is something she would do frequently. She would just kind of appear at shows and drop a number of pieces of paper, possibly things she was working on, Xeroxes of anthology work, zines from other people to just sort of like uh, garner a sense of interest, right? Um, and Master of Drawing Circles is sort of a parody of uh, a fairly prominent cartoonist who has a elaborate system of circles and lines set to uh, define the perfect shape of a comic. But in that she shows something just like um, even more profound, which is the figure of the tortured artist, like literally the idea of art as an expression of a sense of just like absolute torment, right? by her work. My favorite bit of this being these small figures in the lower left corner, just mocking the protagonist. Um, and I gave her a copy of my comic, Steel Punctured Waves, where she bought it from me. And she said it was the, um, the only piece she'd bought that day, which details uh, this kind of complicated inverse world in which um, the wealthy have built an elaborate underwater society that they live in and they've surgically altered themselves to um, to thrive within. Um, these are some panels from it. And this is has themes of like, um, that I think align with some of the stuff in her work of this just sort of like, massive pseudo futuristic but also past kind of gothic sprawling infrastructure right and just like um this melding of a more contemporary of uh, reference to a more contemporary sort of tortured science fiction world and um elements of of gothic fiction and turn of the century fiction and victorian literature right um and one thing that she gave to me was this scene, The Devil's Night, um, which funnily, I had a an anarchist collective near where she was living had um, had made sort of like a nice cardstock bound zine edition of this essay um, on... For people who don't know about Devil's Night, it's the night before Halloween. In Detroit, Michigan, it's um, a night where a lot of arson takes place. And it's just sort of a, a period of somewhat allowed transgression, which gets into some other stuff I'll be talking about, which is uh, the Saturnalia, right? The Roman festival of transgression in which there was a space where sort of all roles were lifted and people were allowed to just sort of revel and mock um, the ruling class and where authority just kind of diminished entirely. Um, but what was funny was that I mentioned to her 
having worked um, with the group that had put out this, this specific zine version of this essay. And she just told me that she wasn't an anarchist and she found the idea of anarchism just, just kind of childish and something that she was beyond, which is um, something that a lot of people talk about. But through this talk, I kind of want to get into the idea of anarchism somewhat removed from contemporary anarchist culture, which I find quite restrictive. But um, anarchism is almost like a, a spiritual force, something that ties into sort of like millenarian cults that ties into um, uh, punk to uh, the origins of, you know, early Russian nihilism to uh, the situationists um, and to, to something kind of across time, right? To a spirit of a um, Saturnalian rejection of authority, right? Um, so I wanted to start talking about this with this quote from Michael Bernstein's Bitter Carnival, which um, is a book that Morgan lent me. Um, I now have a second copy of it. it it's quite good. It, it's about the Saturnalian Festival of Transgression, and it ties it specifically to um, Christiva's theory of objection to power of horror, and to her writing on Celine. He writes on Celine himself, who's an uh, author both me and Morgan, like quite a bit. Um, and further on as it continues, he talks quite a bit about Charles Manson as an expression of this figure that he sees coming out of it called the abject hero. Um, so here he says, whether enacted by men like Ira Einhorn and his followers in the 1960s or by the revolutionary millenarians and mystical anarchists of the Middle Ages, whose violent careers Norman Cohn anatomizes in the pursuit of the millennium, when the tropes of a Saturnalian reversal of all values spill over into daily life. And that, that phrase daily life is going to be important for us. They usually do so with a savagery that is the grim underside of their exuberant affirmations. It is precisely the festival's bitter side, the relationship between its celebratory and its rage-filled aspects that I want to probe. Um, and this is an image uh, on the right is a drawing I did for a tarot deck a friend is working on of the fool. And on the left is an image that, that I'll repeat the sort of finished version of that we've used in a lot of the um, promotion for organ bank of this sort of pained jester whose self is just kind of structured by all of these patches, right? Um, and in talking about the kind of spirit of anarchism. I, I'll save you reading this whole quote, but um, Andre Breton has this really wonderful quote about seeing, just being struck by the image of a black flag wa waving at a demonstration and being unable to totally kind of position politically what that meant, but feeling it as almost a, a spiritual force. And this is something that, um, he referred to throughout his life and is, is to me almost most interesting because he lived his life as somewhat of a result, almost like social Democrat as a, as a socialist and, and not hitting the kind of um, anarchic depths of some of his peers um, and invested in the French Communist Party and, and party politics in general, but still kind of haunted by this idea. Um, so I wanted to, in talking about the spirit of anarchy, then something that really kind of erupts for me as a touchstone is old issues of Black Mask, uh, which was an anarchist periodical in the 60s. And this image um, is from a, a old Fantomos um, serial, right? And it depicts these so the these sort of undead um, prisoners, right? Seeking revenge, um, these murderous corpses, right? Uh, and it's it's being reused here in a way that shows the this kind of idea of a uh, 
undead and a horrific um, abject revenge, right? And a, a revenge of the working class. But also Black Mask is really beautiful as just kind of an example of uh, a well-designed and really kind of a knife at the throat feeling publication. Um, so here we have Bernstein talking about um, but it, about uh, Celine, um, and he says Celine's insistence on describing himself as simultaneously the monster and the martyred victim, although characteristic of his voice from the beginning, is as he fully know unlikely to evoke the same kind of compassion. In a book about the collaboration, as it did in uh, Voyage à Bout de la Nuit, uh, Voyage to the End of the Nights, description of the First World War. Um, it is not only that he can now exploit the reader's indignation and his desire for pity in order to maintain the dialogue, which the novel depends. Celine has so inextricably intertwined the roles of the wise fool and provocateur, monster and disenfranchised victim of hypocrisy that one's response changes page by page, sometimes even phrase by phrase without the text ever letting one reach a settled judgment. Racist diatribes jostle against a melancholic nostalgia for the Qua Riverside restaurants and the silent screen stars of his childhood. And these in turn are part of a fabric that speaks so deeply and with such conviction about the futility and horror of all wars that the ordinary category of evaluation and reaction are constantly disturbed. Or to put in, in terms of its literary effects, our attention is constantly kept alert to the shocks that will have to confront us next. Um, and these images are French cartoonist Tardy uh, illustrating Celine, which is really uh, kind of fascinating to me to think of a place where cartooning has this sort of like uh, literary value, right? And um, is used to show the, this very specific sort of sad haunting and like uh, sardonic um, horror, right? Uh, and here we have a spread from Nightcore Energy, which is Morgan's last comic. Um, and in it, this boy who's believed to be autistic has his brain sort of probed by this shadowy um, psychiatrist corporate figure. Um, it shifts throughout the piece, but um, he is revealing his uh, homicidal impulses. Um, and he says that essentially were he to commit some sort of act of mass violence that he would be the victim um, and that they are the ones who are drawing him to it, which gives us this idea of this sort of abject hero who isn't just purely a monster um, and would almost be a better person if they were, instead is just fueled by a pure, force of resentment. Um, uh, and so this is a quote from Revolution of Everyday Life. Um, History bears witness to two practical attempts at such a supersession, that of the mystic and that of the great refuser. Meister Archite declared, I pray God to absolve me from God. Similarly, the Swabian heretics of 1270 said that they had raised themselves above God and that having attained the highest degree of divine perfection, they had abandoned him. On another tack, the negative tack, certain strong personalities like uh, Eleg Gabalis, Galdere, and Elizabeth Bathory strove, as one can see, to attain a total mastery over the world by the liquidation of intermediaries those who were alienating them positively, they're slaves. They approached the total man via total inhumanity against nature, to, to quote Huseman, right? Uh, so the passion for an unbounded rule and the absolute refusal of const uh, constraints forms uh, the single route and ascending and descending role on which Caligula, Spartacus, Gaidire, Dosa, Gorky stand side by side, together yet separate. However, it is not enough to say that the integral revolt of slaves, 
I insist uh, the integral revolt and not its deficient forms, whether Christian, bourgeois, or socialist, unite with the extreme revolt of the masters of old. In fact, the will to abolish slavery and all its sequels, the proletariat, servants, submissive and passive men offers an unique chance uh, to the will to rule the world with no other limits than, than our invented nature and the resistance of objects to their own transformation. Uh, so this is from Van Dijk's Revolution of Everyday Life, which is an interesting piece. I'm sorry for choosing such a long quotation, but um, it's a somewhat celebratory uh, construction of a sort of uh, anarchism removed from party politics, from um, and from like uh, activism itself and rooted distinctly in everyday life. But what's interesting here is to hear him talk about the liberatory aspect of someone like Guy Dere, right? To the aristocrats that refuse servitude and to a kind of um, liberation and a sort of anarchist urge in like uh, extreme violence and transgression, right? Um, so he continues to talk about uh, the Papin sisters here, who are really inspiring to me. Um, so he's talking about the idea of slaves killing their masters, right? And the uh, transgressive liberation of that. But the Papin sisters are specifically interesting because they there's this sort of in um, Genet's The Maids, he really talks about this. And in La Ceremonie, which we have a screen cap from here, the idea of them as dressing up in their master's clothes and playing the murder of their masters is, is integral. So we have a sort of transgression that couldn't exist without the roles being there, right? That isn't itself defined by its roles, but that is really doing something um, beautiful and, and powerful through that, right? Um, so this is a quote from my piece on TED. Uh, Within industrial society and its future's rejection of the role of specialists, we can clearly chart a non-tyrant monstrosity. TED is a revolutionary agent with no desire to rule and no desire to control. She was no Mishima knowing the bright truth of her ideology would bring about a new world led by her. But she also refused the role of the leftist of the quote, gentler breed. She's thought an abject womanhood formed by action. So in here, I'm sort of playing with um, Ted Kaczynski's attempt to get a referral for a sex change operation uh, while teaching at University of Michigan, um, but really kind of digging into this idea of, for lack of a better word, a revolutionary subject formed by a refusal of control, a, a non-tyrannical impulse towards total liberation. Um, this is from a piece called, I called it Plot to Kill the Giants here. That's not what it's called. It's called The Plot Against the Giants, um, in which a gang of women are sort of drawing out these men in this ritual, sort of Asifile style uh, act of uh, ritual murder, right? This is an old piece of Morgan's that um, my friend Brian found in a in a box somewhere, um, and this you know draws on a lot of the stuff I was just talking about in terms of like women refusing the role assigned to them and um, committing these acts of violence, right? And the transgression innate to that. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about occult visions. Um, and this is a, a picture of Morgan with a, um, a uh, sort of cloth painting, almost like a mural that she did of a uh, hermaphroditic figure uh, mirroring the famous wound man etching, right? Um, crucified, burned on a stake. 
um, crying, right? A sort of like um, transcendental figure that's just being uh, endlessly crucified, right? Um, and this is a, a quote from Gustav Mering's The Gollum, um, in which the main character is given a book to repair that um, sends him into a sort of hallucination in which, uh, one sec, sorry, my words streamed out from invisible mouths, took on a life and came towards me. They twisted and turned before me, changing their shapes like slave girls in their dresses of many colors, then sank into the ground or turned into an iridescent haze in the air and vanished, making room for the next. From the distance, a wild Bacchic procession was charging towards us. Among them were a man and a woman with their arms clasped around each other. I could see them coming when they were still far off. And nearer and nearer came the din of the procession. Now I could hear the singing of the ecstatic dancers echoing all around me. And my eyes sought the entwined couple, but they had been transformed into a single figure, a hermaphrodite, half male, half female, sitting on the throne of a mother of pearl. And the hermaphrodite wore a crown of red with a square piece at the front into which the worms of destruction had eaten mysterious ruins. And I love this. Um, this illustration at the bottom feels very close to the necrophilic landscape in terms of its sense of Gothic place, as does the piece itself. Um, and this is a good bit of what I'm getting at, is this idea of this, this Bacchic procession, this um, sort of ecstatic occult festival in which um, meaning disappears and roles disappear and we're forced to witness a real trauma of the real. Um, but part of my contention is that in that place, a real and authentic violence can form. And part of what we're trying, what I'm trying to do with Organ Pink now in the wake of the death of my partner is um, conceive of a way forward that really holds the reality of, of violence coming forth from um, ecstatic experience. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about entities. Uh, I think some of that writing really mirrors the appearance of this figure uh, in Nightcore Energy. Um, and I think when people are in a position of extreme kind of abjection, when roles start to disappear, when they're struggling to kind of fit in anywhere, they often encounter um, entities, uh, sort of occult figures. Uh, and this is something Morgan talks about in her work. It's something I at times delve into as well. Um, so these entities kind of either communicate telepathically or appear as visions, right? For Morgan, one of her extreme experiences was a, a state of sleep paralysis in which she told me she felt a sort of demon crouched on her chest. And when she looked at him, she saw him shaking his finger at her, saying no, right? And that she couldn't move. Um, and so here I want to talk a little bit about agencies as well. Um, it's my feeling that these sort of entities are tied to and work with um, intelligence agencies uh, or can appear in communication with them in these sort of zones of extremity. We can see it a bit with Crowley. We can see it with Charles Manson and Operation Chaos. Clearly, I didn't finish that sentence there. Um, we can see it with MK Ultra, and we especially see it with organizations like the Order of Nine Angles and their associated organizations like Temple of Blood um, and Adamoff and Division. Um, so Order of Nine Angles were kind of formative for some of the stuff that Morgan gets into in Nightcore Energy. Um, they're a longstanding a uh, neo-Nazi satanic Satanist organization funded founded by David Myatt. Um, they came out of this thing called Column 88, which was a British um, 
neo-Nazi organization that was directly pushed by the government involved in a sort of international conspiracy of things called Operation Gladio. That was an attempt to destabilize leftist organizations through the creation of uh, these just kind of extreme and horrifying right-wing paramilitary groups. Um, but David Mayak kept it going, right? And he formed, uh, he became, he converted to Islam at some point as many Nazis did in the 90s. Um, and his stuff has since bled out onto the internet and through um, cyber culture into organizations like Adam Offen Division who are, are pretty notorious. Um, and Temple of Blood, which is sort of a, a black metal styled uh, subcultural organization that attempts to find these kind of people and funnel them into extremism and and into uh, Azov Battalion in Ukraine, who are a Ukrainian nationalist paramilitary organization that also adopt the aesthetics of black metal, kind of the aesthetics of this sort of transgression that we're talking about um, to sort of an evil end pushed by intelligence agencies and in that in communication with occult and esoteric forces. So, I mean, I, if I haven't been clear, I hope I am clear that these entities are not good, that I'm not necessarily in exploring these, I'm not necessarily in favor of these, or in favor isn't even the right word, how can one be in favor or against, right? I'm not saying that there is an innate good or that I'm attempting to channel them, right? But that I'm attempting to speak to their presence uh, and in attempting to create things that have this sort of horror, this sort of transgression address this great evil, um, an evil that we see in horror quite a bit, epitomized by someone like uh, Stephen King's Randall Flagg, right? Or by David Lynch's uh, Jowde in the third season of Twin Peaks, the idea of this occult, presence of of great violence and evil that just sort of appears at these historic moments. Um, so there's a bit of that in, in my comic, uh, Penetration of the Skin. There's a point where the main character takes a lover in who he then wakes to find has disappeared and he um, hears a thump and a sound, an animal sound, right? That deposits something on his door, which is his lover eviscerated, right? And the idea here is that um, whether it's him or whether it's something else, that normal everyday life can punctuate in these extreme experiences, be they erotic, be they um, romantic, be they uh, esoteric, right? And that from there, you can suddenly be plunged into just an unknowable world, right? Um, and I, I'm shifting topics a little bit, but I wanted to talk about gore and, and sickness, which are the things that permeate our work. Uh, these are drawings from Morgan, um, sort of gore grind images. Um, and sickness is something that is really important to me in, in this project and in uh, situating historically with the color yellow, right? Placing it near the decadent yellow books, um, conceiving of um, a sort of philosophy of a reactive and powerful and eviscerating um, sickness, right? Um, Here's some more of our promotional stuff, including uh, this precious moments image from Morgan, which features gore coming out of a cave. Um, my own image of a um, hooded figure strangling a uh, doctor, uh, cementing us within um, anti-psychiatry. Uh, uh, what I feel is a very powerful rejection of roles by rejecting um, psychiatry itself and diagnosis itself. Uh, here I'm using uh, the famous line from the social Socialist Patients Collective, turn illness into a weapon. Um, so I wanted to talk about subculture too, and kind of present this idea that uh, this kind of role of the object hero, 
uh, and this this process of Saturnalian dialogue is really exemplified in in subculture art because what it does is it takes this sort of like gin alley um, cartooning as a system for describing moral virtue, right? And instead creates its own kind of perverse moral virtue um, that is against the figure of the poser, as we see with this crucified Kermit the Frog, this crucified poser Kermit the Frog drawn by a uh, dad of the band Mayhem, by the murder of cops, authority figures like that, as we see on the shitlickers cracked cop skull, LP, um, and just uh, the sense of patched clothing, the sense of, and these just like visible s signifiers, almost like uh, one would see in a depiction of a saint or something like that, but instead um, showing the sort of uh, world of like revelry and transgression and of, of these strict stratified roles, but that are themselves just entirely opposed to um, straight society, right? Um, this is Gin Lane, right? The kind of classic um, moral cartoon that we're seeing this in opposition to. Um, and this is Morgan, to me, taking that sort of reversal you see in uh, subculture art and putting it even deeper, um, where she's trying to position herself. She's struggling to find a sense of identity within subculture, but also feeling herself fundamentally alienated from it. Um, and as a result, attempting to lampoon or go after uh, the ways she sees these sort of enforcers of subculture as, as a force for um, essentially a recuperated version of their own kind of straight society right, who are obsessed with policing the uh, specifics of their communities. Um, and this sort of subcultural figure, this sort of doom guy figure, as, as was seen on, on the previous doom band illustration, right, um, but instead one who's sort of a, a fool who's being tormented right, and who is attempting to fashion themselves out of all of these kind of signifiers, but they're all just like a little off because she's fundamentally just um, operating at a level of transgression that far exceeds anything that could be contained within culture. Um, and then talking a little bit about my own approach to subculture, uh, which is taking elements of more masculine, more aggressive subculture and, and feeling a real beauty and admiration, um, something akin to resentment, but, but not, right? A, a sense of myself is wholly outside of it and unable to ever fully fit into it, but a, a real admiration for the rituals of masculinity and for, in, in my comic penetration of the skin, specifically skinhead masculinity, and it's a very strict dress code and the ways it impacts the body, right? The way it sits on the body. Um, and then in organ bank as well, I wanted to talk about just the position of the absolute outsider, which is something Morgan is really focused on getting out there. Uh, this is Ryan Gregory. Um, he was a producer that went by the name of Sludgehammer um, around 2013 or so. Um, and he, his career, I guess, in terms of that kind of fell apart and he experienced bouts of homelessness, drug addiction, um, and he did some writing for Organ Bank that I, I'm hoping to put out as part of an anthology that we're working on that features quite a bit of writing from these sort of absolute outsiders. And he's really interesting to me as someone who has the same sort of interests as me in metal and punk and rap, who um, has just never really been able to fully fit in. From what I understand, he might have died earlier this year. I saw multiple references to it online. I can't seem to track him down. And his stuff sort of ends there. Um, but here's some writing from him. Um, 
he says, I'm waiting on an Uber to take me to rehab or a mental hospital to sleep in. The cops said it's not their problem. I'm withdrawing from my meds. I'm going to jail if I call again. I stayed in the squat in the US one for like four days. I'm so tired. I want to kill myself. I really can't tell if you're an agent or something to do with the V2X bugging or whatever the fuck is happening to me. Um, I live near Satellite Beach in, in Florida, and it's definitely gang stalking. My ex's dad is an agent and her husbands are in M13. I'm like a domestic terrorist person. They put scalps with my hair in the water when I went to the beach over a year ago. I get tortured nonstop. And then he continues to talk about how there's a bigger picture with the queer crust punk radicalism in general and my older brother's schizophrenia. I'm either being gaslit by white hat hacker people in mass or triple six mafia and project Pat were originally vocoded to speak to him specifically to give him a schizophrenic system and it, um, and the schizophrenic diagnosis, um, you know, he says quite a bit in here and he continues to say, I'm kind of interested in scatology, but not really going to prioritize it. But there's something about that and insanity and mystical properties in addition to bacterialism of schizoautism, et cetera, especially when we excrete what we call our psychic waste in nuclear communities. So he's talking about kind of the psychogeography of Florida here. He's talking about diagnosis, rejecting it, um, forming himself around all of these subcultural signifiers. I originally became acquainted with Morgan's appreciation of his work and his name through Morgan playing me a um, mashup he did of Katie Got Bands I Need a Hit a with uh, Burzum's Dunkel Height, which is really incredible. Uh, and both songs I am already a huge fan of or was already a huge fan of. Um, but, you know, here before I use this uh, pretty well-known Deleuze quote, a schizophrenic out for a walk is a better model than an erotic lying on an analyst couch, uh, a breath of fresh air or relationship. And that's what um, people like this who Morgan was really drawn to, excuse me, really exemplify is um, this idea of uh, these people who exist as this complete uh, intersection of concepts, just totally overwhelming, all kind of positive, um, that exist in the world, that have an everyday life, that report on their everyday life and, and move through uh, society and subculture. Um, I apologize if my cat meowing is audible. So that gets us to everyday life, right? which is a big part of what um, I want to talk about in this project. And these are photographs from Morgan. Um, that's one of me in the car. That's one of her foot and some dog I don't know. There's one of uh, a homeless friend of hers when she was living in um, Berkeley. There's one of the lead singer of the band Cemetery performing in this sort of tattered clothes. Um, and I big part of what I want to do with this project is just deliver kind of real experience and talk about the stuff and, and frame transgression in a um, context that ties into all of our lived experiences, right? And to frame transgression as not just this totally abstract, overwhelming, horrific, otherworldly thing, but also something that, um, and, and a cold experience and violence and um, that like intersect with all of our daily lives, right? Um, and so this is some writing from Oregon Bank uh, Associate member, uh, Daphne Dahlgren. This just went up on our um, website. Uh, this was a report back from a visit we did to visit uh, the Wise Mart in uh, Eaton County, Pennsylvania, where the spree shooter, Randy Starr, uh, took the lives of three of his coworkers. He was a really prolific animator. 
um, who made these sort of strange films about uh, these massive sort of versions of the goth girl from Danny Phantom. Um, so Daphne reports on the experience of us walking through this, uh, you know, random grocery store that um, we have to get to the bathroom. We have to go through the employee lounge and we're just seeing kind of experiencing this extreme psychic wound in a physical place that's ultimately, you know, completely mundane, but that does have this sort of um, beauty contained within its mundanity. Um, so she talks about the sublime in this context, right? Saying the sublime is exemplified by an overriding of the rational faculties of discernment. The moment of the mind's meeting with holy terror in all its reverence and repulsion. The sublime is not the beautiful harmonious arrangement of nature and repose. It is the unnerving torpor of a sinking ship. The snowflake shapes of broken glass planes after an earthquake, a fraction of this feeling suffice the act of crossing the threshold in the air conditioned lobby. Each of our circulatory systems seized by chains of lightning pulses, eyes soaked in the phosphorescent fluorescence. Um, and that kind of, uh, you know, some people have been using the phrase American sublime, but um, it feels useful in that, like, I we want to delve into the sublime experiences of these spaces that we all pass through. And for me, like road trips are part of it too. Um, a part of Morgan's Nightcore Energy was based on her friend Lily's um, childhood school in which she road tripped with her, her ex anomaly um, or visited upon on a road trip, right? And that, that experience of visiting these relatively mundane spaces, um, but knowing just like the extremity that moves through them and through our daily lives is something that um, we're really striving to capture. And Nat, um, one of our contributors and a, a participant in Oregon being a member of our cabal um, wrote about this in his piece, Mother's Breast. Um, and in here he talks about seeing a uh, burning, I'm, going to totally, I can't even really do the pronunciation of it at this moment, right? This Russian dancer, um, watching him pee in the bathroom. Um, and just these moments of, you know, ob observation of art in a bathroom, right? Um, and this sort of mythical idea of this child killing himself, all of these really extreme ideas intersecting with the things that form our daily life. Um, so that's kind of most of what I wanted to talk about. Um, let me stop share. Um, I hope that answered some questions about, or not answered some questions, but uh, revealed some about uh, what we're trying to get into with this project. Um, the project is really, you know, about creating physical documents that express this kind of transgression, this sort of Saturnalian narrative um, that people can find and can affect their lives and can just fundamentally shift things for people um, and to be able to assemble those by hand and disseminate them as widely as we possibly can, right? Um, that concludes what I had to talk about. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that presentation. And I actually have, it actually brought up a lot of questions I'd like to ask you. Um, I'm going to limit myself to one or two to start off. I encourage other people to, um, to ask questions at this time. Um, I kind of, one of the, one of the key things that I wanted to know more about and I think maybe you get at it a bit with your discussion of everyday life towards the end. But you use this phrase at some point where you said 
violence from ecstatic experience. And it seemed as if you were talking about that in a, in a positive sense. And then you talk about these organizations, um, MK Ultra and, and um, Gladio stuff. And you're, you're, you're explicitly saying, you know, these are, these are not, how could they be? These are not things that you're bringing endorsement to. And I, I kind of want to, it seems like the opposition between those two things, um, I can guess at, at, at what the difference you see between those two, di- like your term of violence from ecstatic experience and those other expressions of this. I, I think I can guess at, at what you mean or, or what the difference is. Mm-hmm. But I'm curious if you could if you could maybe expand on that a little bit, like like yes. Well, it's a complicated thing in in talking about this stuff in part because uh, there's somewhat of a difference between the ethos of Organ Bank and the ethos of myself, right? Which is maybe a little bit of the the um, tension that comes there. I mean that that tension is something I really am wanting to look at. Um, because like the I, idea kind of that uh, Bernstein gets into in Bitter Carnival is that we're seeing the sort of like that there's these extreme abject expressions from someone like, let's say, Charles Manchin that we feel this sort of pull towards and then that we see them um, to say like horrifically racist or bizarre things. We see the effects of their actions and the transgression is in our experience of that sort of schism, right? Um, But I don't know, like, um, I guess I just want to largely bring attention to the fact that there's these, um, that these sort of experiences occur and that um, these sort of events occur. And and the distinction between them, I guess, is just like, um, has to do with, I mean, talking about MK Ultra and talking about Gladio and stuff like that, those are things being perpetrated by the ruling class, right? By, to um, seek so- societal control and to use division to create a more stratified society. And there's instead like uh, of that, I think what we're really pushing for is the idea of um, the beauty and like piercing truth of things that somehow manage to escape the grips of um, these sort of, of the control society, right? I have more questions around that, but I'm gonna hold on to them for now. And I'm gonna ask uh, the first question from the audience. And this is from, um, I might be mispronouncing this name, but from Aaron. Aaron, would you mm-hmm. like to read this question out loud or would you like me to read it? I can count to five um, to see what you say. I can just go ahead and read it then. Um, hi, Pris, first time, long time. Um, can you speak to how you see a kind of anarchic transgression that rejects a kind of didactic morality of contemporary progressive art without embracing a reactionary counter signaling masquerading as transgress as transgression present in some of the contemporary avant-garde it's a very good question yeah great question aaron um i guess for me it's kind of about doing what i i hope i did in the talk which is uh, kind of being clear about where my own values are and referencing a cultural history of um, left communism and stuff like that. Um, and just kind of like what I really try to do, like in my writing on Ted Kaczynski, I'm not presenting a uniform embrace of those people, but um trying to kind of inject my own didactic perception of their philosophies in a way that like keeps the really vital aspects, but also shows what is just kind of their resentment, right? The things that fuel their potentially more reactionary tendencies. And I hope that in doing that, in refusing to just sort of like blindly present reactionary work and like 
um, trying to look at the, um, or like work that could be used towards reaction. I don't think there's anything explicitly reactionary that Oregon has published. Yeah, I mean, but in exploring these subjects, right, having, uh, doing something like a book like Male Fantasies does, where you're presenting all of this information and really trying to uh, tear at the sort of personal impulses of, of horrific actions of uh, monstrous people, right? <laughs> I should say I don't I, I agree with you. I don't see um reactionary work that you've that that you've published or that Organ Bank Bank is working with, but I do see a reactionary trend in you know that's coming down maybe the same road that that you're coming down with mm -hmm. your concerns and takes a reactionary stance. I'm gonna read this um and I think it's that's what's compelling to me about your project that it it, it right. explicitly avoids that. Um I'm going to read a question from Noel Freebert. Um, he says, uh, I loved hearing the context of the work you all are doing, and I'm excited to see what Oregon will publish in the future. I wanted to ask about the new edition of Volley, by, um, uh, by mm -hmm. which I have here. Uh, there's, a four, uh, there's four pages that are added from the original that really ex expanded the work in a heavy way. Uh, the added pages felt so essential. Um, I was curious about why those pages were left out of the original edition. So the short answer is, I don't know. Um, the longer answer is that, I mean, it's funny, the longer answer, I think both you and um, probably Austin as well know, which is that Morgan would make very, very kind of abrupt and arbitrary decisions about her work and how it was presented in a way I wasn't even ever really let in on. So um, in finding the original files for this piece, I I also found there were four pages that not only contextualize it, but add um, a sense of like emotional impact that that adds so much to the story to me. And that that felt really important to preserve. Um, I vaguely remember Morgan telling me that she had excluded basically a single sheet of paper, right, and printing those four pages from its publication, and that it was better, <laughs> right? And that is about it, right? I, I remember um, selling these from Morgan, and um, she asked that I send them back to her and, and stop selling them, and I you know, she didn't tell me the reason. I, I assume I had made some kind of, you know, I disappointed her in some kind of way. But yes, it's true. She did make very, very quick decisions about how the work was going to be um, right. presented. Um, I also think that the the um, the work that's come out recently from you, um, Organ Bank, uh, 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 um, Nightcore Energy is the one that I think people have really uh, connected with the most. But I thought that this one was, um, at least for my yeah. Uh, taste. I, I think much, much deeper and, and much richer. I'm going to read a question um, from LF and LF, I'll do the same thing. Would you like to read um, this question out loud? I'll count to five again. Let's see what they say. Read for me. Okay. Um, thank you for this discussion. Did you or Morgan ever get spooked by your own investigations uh, into the stay behind networks of uh, occulted entities and organizations, et cetera? And if so, to what extent do you feel that avant-garde art and cartooning can meaningfully deal with these topics? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, the answer is absolutely. And we were planning on publishing some work on Order of Nine Angles and um, I that fucking freaks me out because Temple of Blood is weirdly connected to black metal in general. I'm a big black metal fan and it, it's weird to see the tendrils of these sort of like Nazi Satanists funded by intelligence agencies delve into your own communities. That's the thing that really fucking scared me was that when it stops being abstract, when you can say, oh, this tape I bought, this label has a, has a track or like has an album called Temple of Blood that is seemingly being put out by one of their entities, right? 
it's that shit is scary. But what cartooning can do to confront it, um, I mean, meaningfully is probably just to address it and to kind of take a stand on um, the infiltration of the infiltration, especially into these sorts of spaces of transgression by nefarious actors, right? Um, I actually kind of wanted you to expand on something um, that's in that, and you, you you talked about it a little bit, but that's in the um, uh, the promotional flyer for Organ Bank, uh, and it says um, turning illness into a weapon, anti psych, and I think there's um, different radical politics that critique psychiatry, some uh, more um, um, aggressively than others. I'm kind of, and you you touched on it a little bit, but I'm wondering if you could, it's, it's, it's so central to that, to that promotion of Organ Bank and it's there in bold letters um, and, and depicted graphically. Could you talk a little bit more about, about what your intentions yeah. behind that are? Yeah. So it's funny because I just, after I made that flyer, I started to have a bit of a um, a bit of uncertainty about how much how invested I am in the idea of anti psychiatry. Not necessarily because I don't believe in the tenets of it, but in that I feel like in ways it doesn't go quite far enough um, because it it still does kind of reify the notion of the identity of illness. Um, but regardless, I think. It's something really important to address because we live in a in a time right now where, especially in the the radical left, for some reason we see a weird embrace of psychiatry and of uh, medication and of uh, psychiatric diagnosis and a, a push for self diagnosis, uh, and these are all things I think are insidious and kind of evil. Um, and Organ Bank as a project is. Uh, opposed to psychiatric violence, right, and wants to confront the attempt to totally just kind of destroy radical individuals through um, an elaborate system of uh, mental control by professionals and by by literal pharmaceutical companies, right? Yeah, it's um. Oh, there's a message here. Um... Uh, Phoebe says, amen to this. And LF says, very true. I think it's, yeah, it's, does that feel like a recent tendency in, um, in leftist politics response to psychiatry? I mean, it. I guess it depends on, these are such wide swaths of categories when we talk about this stuff, but there's, I think there's, um, a, a, some, some text I was reading maybe six years ago, um, seemed more, um, um, situated against psychiatry, but maybe do you see, do you see that as like a, um, a, a yeah. recent trend maybe in the last few years and what, why might that be? Um, I would definitely say it's exploded over the last five to 10 years. And, um, I think part of it has to do with, uh, radical politics, especially like I feel, and I was talking a bit about this in my talk, I feel fundamentally alienated from what is, is currently called uh, the left or, or, or radicals in general, in part because of a ob complete and total obsession with identity and with personal identity. Um, and I see psychiatry as uh, sort of recuperating uh, people's innate feeling of alienation by pushing them into by encouraging this, this system of identification that just stratifies everything for them and allows them to feel persecuted as though they're a victim as the result of these uh, biochemical left, specifically in the left. I, it, perhaps it's some sort of psyop, perhaps it has to do with Tumblr, right? Or, or current social media trends. I'm, I don't exactly know. Yeah, well, that's a really interesting response. I was gonna um, ask one more um, question, and I, I encourage anyone to ask another um, question in the chat as I as I um, say this one. Um, 
you were talking about the style that Morgan worked in after Necrophilic Landscape uh, with, with um, Organ Bank and Volley, and you were saying that it was whittled down. Um, I think some people might uh, look at the work and and maybe their first emotional response would be that um, the the work looks um, looks colder or more clinical because uh, Necrophilic Landscape has this um, here. I have an edition of it right here. Um, looks very the the um, you you might say that there's a, a rich expression in the lines, or it's it's very right. um, it's there, there's you you can you can see the person's um, you can see some feeling just in the lines. But I um would you what if someone described the newer work as colder? What might be your response to that, or or do you see something different going on? I would say cold is definitely a word I would use, but I think like it's interesting looking at some of her sketches and stuff like that, you can see her. And and I think it started before her work for Organ Bank. I think um, Master of Drawing Circles was kind of where she debuted that sort of style. Um, and it's interesting because she would do the same drawing like four or five times. It almost has the feeling of like in classical painting or something where you just have an endless series of studies. And then you have just like the full realization of that. So it it was this sort of style of just like absolute clarity that she was representing that uh, I don't know what the creative choice for it was. I think part of it was wanting to have a more kind of anime-like style because underground anime um, or manga-like, right? Because underground manga was such a... Uh, formative thing for her and something that that drew a lot of the sort of uh, vocabulary she used visually. Um, but I think cold is probably a word I would use, but also just sort of like um, primitive in a way. I also felt just like her growing as a, you know, her powers as a storyteller. I just feel like she's kind of, um, th those, those, later works are so masterful and I, I feel like she um is just presenting it exactly with the only what needs to be there i'm going to read a question from leomi sadler um would you like to read this or do you want me to read it okay i can uh unmute you go ahead Oh, I think you're you're still muted. You're still muted. Hi, yeah. Uh, there you go. Hey. Um, I was gonna ask because um, I guess my only contact really with Morgan was through in like emails and Instagram, and her name would change a lot. And I guess I started thinking about: is it tricky for Organ Bank to use social media, or is it something? that's interesting for you to play with um, as a medium, um, having control over like anonymity and perception, that sort of mm. thing. Um, I don't know, it's, yeah, I don't know if that's even interesting. <laughs> no, that's a good question. <laughs> I wanted to ask, I was curious. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of hate using social media in general. There's a complicated part of this project is, um, and even of organizing this talk is wanting to talk with Morgan's kind of shifting aliases and infinitely reoccurring series of social media stuff. And of me not wanting to just kind of fully dissect and destroy her mystery, um, keeping a sort of, keeping myself a little back and really um, just letting people buy the work and letting others promote it to some degree and, and seeing it seemingly do really well is exciting. Um, right now I'm really stoked about having a website that I can put things on that exists outside of social media, right? With our first blog post up, I'm really excited to keep uh, adding to that and being able to have like a wider control that people can then check out. Um, but it's funny because I, I think about keeping Morgan's vision alive and I'm like, should I be more um, 
cryptic and strange and play with people more. And but I don't really, I don't know how much I have it in me, right? <laughs> Um, I feel like I'm a fairly direct person and don't like to play games with people in the same way that she did. So it's um, it's complicated, right? Um, I'm going to read a question from Phoebe. Um, I wonder if Pris could speak a bit more about cartooning comics itself. Why does this medium excite her today? And where does she see the possibilities for new life within it? So much contemporary work within the medium just leaves me cold, but Oregon is doing something different. Yeah, so um, cartooning is weird. I like it as a marriage of words and pictures, both of which I like as, as both a writer and an illustrator. It's also just something that I perhaps have maybe a, a childish fixation on, right? Because reading Sandman is a, pretty young kid um, in like late elementary school, totally, uh, I don't know, impacted how I perceive storytelling and art. And I really kind of long to be able to capture that sort of narrative, right? To be able to communicate both visually and through words, a um, really moving and expansive narrative. I don't know that I can produce at quite that level, Right, but that's that's the kind of thing I really want to um, see comics do. But it's sad because now, especially in alternative comics, we have a, a push towards a kind of lack of narrative, a real focus on these kind of pseudo abstract drawings on uh, auto bio that isn't isn't vital. That's a little feel good. Right. Or a little like, oh, my day was sad. I, my cereal got soggy and then I met my friend Tom, you know? So I hope we can do something different um, with Oregon Bank and, and really do kind of vital narrative work with it. That's also fairly accessible by virtue of having pictures, right? When you met Morgan at Cake, you were working in, you, you had started working in the style that, that, um, this zine is done in you that I, I I'm forgetting the name of it, but the the work that that uh, Morgan bought from you um, mm -hmm. was kind of in this vein. And I am interested in just just in terms of making art and making drawings. What are I can there, there's influences I can maybe sense, um, but it's also um, such it's it's I can guess it influences, but it's so much your singular way of telling stories and 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 the, your, your way of mark making. Um, that whatever those influences are, are, are still somewhat obscure to me. So I'm kind of just wondering where you, so, like coming to Cake and the community of mm -hmm. comics that you perceived at that time, where you, what, what your interest in it was and, and what you were trying to do with it at that moment and, and what it feels like now. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, my influences at that time and still, still to this day for a big part, I, I really like working with Brush. Um, I spent a long time trying to develop a practice that doesn't use microns, right? That, um, is tied to a, a fairly traditional style of, of ink drawing. Um, and visual influences for me, Jose Munoz is kind of, um, the God. And I really love his use of politics and subculture are also something that really inspire me in, in my own personal work. Um, Charles Burns at that time was a big one. Now, not that I, not that I don't like Burns's work at all, but um, he's a little cleaner than I feel like I will ever be able to do, right? <laughs> so he's more of someone I admire than an influence. I'm going to read this question from Aaron, um, and uh, this is building off of the social media question. Do you see the funneling of digital communication into a small number of centralized platforms being a, a detriment to the gestation of outsidery subcultures? Does this allow for encounter with outsiders without an inherent understanding of mutual interest that invites voyeurism? And do you feel hopeful of the 
desertion away from centralized social media towards smaller but less penetrable forums. Yeah, I mean, y yes to all of that. I, as I said previously, I really do despise social media and long to create something out of it. And the kind of thing I really want to see is, because uh, I'm not totally opposed to the use of the internet. I think there is kind of vital and interesting stuff that can be done with it, especially in terms of just disseminating ideas really broadly. Um, I would love to see web rings come back. I would love to see people have websites on servers that they have complete control over, linking to each other's work, communicating with each other, trying to devise a way to like host things in a way that's accessible to anyone, but is, um, is also somewhat obscured. And, um, and that kind of avoids all of the main traps of social media, right? And to have that intersect with the physical world. Um, well, I wanted to, um, with, with talking about that, I wanted to put a link again to um, the Organ Fail uh, website. And I just want to, first, I want to really thank you for this talk, which I, I thought was, um, I think the ideas that you're working with are complex. And um, I think one of the, the beautiful aspects of this talk was that um, you didn't reduce their complexity in any way, um, but the, you, you really presented them in a way that I think... Um, um, for people who aren't familiar with what you're doing already or, or where you're coming from, I, I think there was a, um, a great degree of accessibility. And I think you were talking about like whether to be cryptic or, or not be cryptic. I, I think with these ideas and these things you're working with, I think the, um, the, real, the real radical kind of way to work with them is, is to be direct. And I, I, I really right. appreciated that in this talk. And um, I really admire uh, the way or the way that you're running Organ Bank and getting these uh, publications out to people in a very clear, straightforward. And I think, you know, I mean, uh, maybe this seems uh, different from the themes we're talking about, but I, I think in a really reliable way, um, which, mm -hmm. which I think is part of true zine culture, communicating with people, you know, there's a trust involved in sending people money for these things and them and them showing up in a, in a, in a clear way. And I, right. I think that is, um, that's very important to me. And I think the, the, the publications themselves um, are clearly, they're, they're printed in such a uh, economical way, um, but they're, they're so elegant in their beauty too. So I just wanted mm. to say that at the end and really thank you thank for you. your time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I encourage everyone to to click that link and we will have this video. Um, I think this is a video that also will, will be good for people to refer back to. Um, so this will be up on YouTube uh, later tonight or tomorrow. And um, I encourage everyone to come back next week for um, we will have Amy Lockhart at the same time and the same place. Uh, so thank you all so much. And thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Bye.